In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Following a process most often leads to a well-produced product. Here's one to work through, I think, fitting for our geography. Get some milk, number one. Get some milk and heat it up. Then add calcium chloride and culture to that heated milk. Step three, coagulate or mix this milk solution with something called rennet. Rennet is an enzyme that acts on proteins found in milk. And this is an important step, so be sure not to skip it. Step four, cut the now hardening surface of the milk solution into three quarter inch cubes. Heat these cubes slowly to 116 degrees Fahrenheit over 30 minutes and continue to cook for 30 to 60 minutes after reaching this temperature. Step six, drain these now cooked cubes in a cloth lined colander for 15 to 20 minutes. Twist the cloth at the end to press everything together. Seven, press more thoroughly with a gallon jug of water on top of a plate under which these milk cubes rest. And this should go on for one to three hours. Step eight, the product can now be broken into smaller pieces and tossed or seasoned with some salt, according to taste. And finally, step nine, enjoy the cheese curds that you just made. And if they squeak when you eat them, that means you have done well. Share them if you would like. When following a process, or a recipe, or a curriculum, or an instruction manual, just kidding, nobody reads those, when doing most of these things, each step plays an important part until the end result is accomplished. And the first process ever put into place took place over the first seven days of history from calling light into existence, to the sky above us and the land beneath us, the lights in the sky, including the sun, moon, and stars, to the birds of the air, to the, animal, to the fish of the sea, and then the animals that walk around on land, and then the pinnacle of God's creation in man and woman. God finished this first process by establishing rest on the Sabbath day. From there, more processes than we can likely number have followed. Our lesson for this morning offers us a process that Jesus is setting up for his disciples in the lead-up to his pending departure. He said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As we saw last week, Jesus relayed clearly to his disciples what would be required of him for salvation from sin to be shared with the world. He knew the sadness they would face as they lived through the fear-inspiring events surrounding his death and resurrection. But he also told them that their mourning would turn to joy, that a process would unfold and lead them to seeing, seeing him again after a little while. Now we find another portion of that same conversation. He gives them a preliminary glimpse into the process of the final stages of the Father's plan for salvation. With a reference to the ascension wherein Jesus would disappear before their eyes in order to take his seat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he also lays out the coming of the source of ongoing guidance and help for the church. Just before his ascension, Jesus instituted holy baptism, the means by which his apostles, his sent ones, would go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. By water and the word, faith is sealed in the hearts of those who receive it, planted firmly by the Holy Spirit. This saving work establishes a connection between everyone to whom this is given and also Christ's death and resurrection. Paul relays this process for us in Romans chapter 6, beginning with this familiar question. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death 
in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is how we are brought into the church, and we have ongoing assistance and guidance from the Helper, who came after Jesus' going to the Father. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The work of the Holy Spirit is laid out for us here. He is present and working daily through the Word. And it is by this work that we are gathered together here each week to receive the promise that though we are convicted and guilty of our sin, by faith we believe and we are declared righteous. Jesus is laying out the process and series of events that need to take place in order for his bride, the church, to be in good working order. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said he will take, that, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the eternal three-in-one Godhead, has always been. He has always existed. Working out of love, each of the three persons of the Trinity were present and working when the first process was ever put into place. Beginning with that call for light to come into darkness, all was declared good when it was finished. Our parents, Adam and Eve, disobeying the clear and orderly caution against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, brought about the curse of sin and the specter of death that follows it. The selfish desire to be like God in that moment lives also in each of our hearts and in our minds as well. And we follow in their footsteps as we love ourselves and what we want over the good and orderly law of God. As a result, the process of our salvation, which needs to come from outside of us and apart from our work, was also put into place. This came together according to God's timing and plan, and it looked like this. Step one, create the world in seven days, establishing the importance of rest at the end. Step two, give dominion over your creation to man and woman, along with the call for them to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. Step three, when man brings sin upon himself in a damning decision to declare himself a divine authority, take it upon yourself to promise him a way out of the eternal punishment he deserves and that a savior will come from within his own family line. Step four, raise up faithful men who will lead your covenant people, always assuring them of your loving and forgiving presence through the sacrificial system established for them as part of their formal worship. Step five, send prophets to keep the people mindful of that coming Savior. Some are heeded more closely than others. Season with discipline at your discretion. Step six, bring the promised Savior into human flesh using a young virgin. The Holy Spirit will oversee this overshadowing of her womb. Step seven, watch as the Savior, your very Son, interacts with the fallen world and brings relief to many who suffer sin's effects while sharing your life-changing word. Step eight, send him to a gruesome and undeserved public execution with sinful men shedding his blood and nailing him to a tree. Wait three days. Step nine, enjoy the glory of his resurrection and the ways that he proves himself to be alive again. Watch as he ascends to be seated next to you and then send the Holy Spirit to share salvation with sinful people through the faith he breathes into their hearts by your word alone, which is joined to water, bread, and wine for the purpose of delivering the physical promise of forgiveness each week 
in the divine service. This is the process put in place to bring about the only solution to sin and death. God oversees it and in fact sees it through to complete this work for our sake. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together in making us and keeping us his forgiven, redeemed, and sanctified people. Each of us, then, plays a role in following the guiding work of the Spirit as we turn from our sin and follow his cues in serving the world around us with his love. Amen. We stand together and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived...